Okay, welcome back, everybody. Come and have a seat, and we'll, uh, we'll begin our third panel discussion. I knew in saying um, we're just going to take a two or three minute break, I knew, I knew what was going to happen. I knew it. I'm getting used to it. <laughs> okay, okay, so um, let me tell you about our, our third discussion. So this, as you know, is on the, uh, the very important subject of um, employability. This is the fastest growing sector, uh, the economic sector in the world today. So it's important that we are developing the skills and the capabilities that match that, uh, that rapid growth. So I guess this is going to be one of those opportunities where we're not only able to hear how uh, the industry is challenging um, our schools, such as Les Roches, but also how Les Roches is challenging the industry as well. So let me introduce our, our panel to you today. Um, our, first, uh, our first guest is somebody from the Kempinski Group. He's been in the business uh, 25 uh, years, um, but he's maintained his passion, he says. He's extremely passionate about his brand, but he's also passionate about the people who are delivering that brand experience for him. So would you please welcome the VP of Talent Development for Kempinski, Michel Gehrig. And our second panelist is someone who uh, built his career, his own career, from um, starting in a hotel management school. So um, you, can, uh, you can talk to a little bit about his path and uh, how he's progressed from there. Um, Accor has recently undergone a, a major transformation earlier this year. And he has put service and attitude as critical to the success of Accor in the future. Um, he has a wonderful title. He's, uh, he's, I'm going to read this out because it's so good. He's a VP of Global HR Development, Service and Attitude Global Marketing. How about that? Would you please welcome Dirk Jan Rechts. Uh, and um, our third panellist um, comes from Laureate. Uh, so we're very pleased to have with us today the president and CEO of Laureate Global Products and Services. Um, Paula leads the, in included in her role, she's leading the global programs on hospitality management. So uh, these are very diverse, as you will know, in their nature, but also they're very different in what Laureate are doing from many uh, traditional hotel management schools. So would you please give a nice warm welcome to Paula Singer. Thank you very much. Chivalry. It is, yes, it's not dead, you see. It's all here, That's it's good. all here. Um, wonderful, okay, so let's start as we have been in the other two panels, if we may, and just talk a little bit about the brand and your own business, and then it talks about employability within that. That would be, that would be great. Um, Michelle, can I start with you? Tell us a little bit about the Kempinski brand. Well, obviously, a, a, an extremely exciting brand and, and crazy enough, you know, to take a chef out of its environment and make him all of a sudden in charge for talent. So that's Kempinski for you. <laughs> um, what basically Kempinski is in another level is that uh, it's a five-star luxury group, uh, hotel group, naturally. Um, but more importantly, has the roots in Europe. So we put a lot of emphasis on, on, on European flair and obviously being from Europe. Um, not only this, but uh, Kempinski as such is, uh, is a hotel group, and this is why I'm really uh, so passionate and excited to work uh, as part of this group, is, um, you know, we are almost like a group of individuals. We have certain minimal guidelines, but we are relying as a group very much on, on the fact that you have almost like a white canvas in front of you, and you make it your own. And that can happen on a corporate level, but certainly very much also in a hotel level. And, and so that's a little bit Kempinski for you, um, strongly developing in great and exciting destinations. And um, yeah, but people driven. And I'm sure we're going to speak mm. about this a little bit later. That's OK. Yeah. Well, when you say it's sort of a European feel to it, how does that differ from maybe some of the other more familiar brands, that are sort of global brands? 
Well, because obviously, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on the fact that when we speak about service today and quality, that, you know, we, we're saying this is really where it's, where it, it came from Europe, doesn't okay. it? And, and, and that's why we always, when we speak about, you know, luxury, luxury somehow for me certainly always started somewhere in Europe, isn't it? And entrepreneurship and what we discussed before, I mean, that obviously has a lot to do with it, but more important is the attention to detail. I think that's really where it, which comes from Europe. And uh, I see that as, as really some segments which are extremely important and speak actually for, um, for Kempinski as such. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, and do, tell us a little about um, Accor. Now you're responsible for some of the, the luxury um, brands. I can't, can't think of the right phrasing now for that, but how the upscale, is that right? Upscale luxury brands? Luxury and upscale brands. Lux yeah. sorry, luxury and upscale <laughs> brands. Yeah. Tell us a little about that. Okay, so well, a little bit of history to that. As you just mentioned, uh, you know, Accor has gone through an enormous transformation in the last, I would say, 12 months um, <coughs> with a new leader called Sebastian Bazin. He came from, from the finance background. Uh, he was previously um, managing the, uh, what is it, the Stade de France uh, football called Paris Saint-Germain, and he successfully sold it to the Qataris. So he's definitely an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, but you know, when he came on board, he was, uh, he was really not happy with the status of affairs within our core. Uh, he did a big research. He discovered that the group, especially in Europe, they were becoming too big, uh, too, much, too many people sitting in corporate offices, no focus on digital marketing, uh, no focus on food and beverage, um, too French-centric, not being a real international company. So, so with that in the mind, he started to change things around. And one of the, 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 the things that he was really insistent to do is to move one of the global uh, responsibilities outside of France. So <clears throat> we have the, uh, the global marketing office for luxury upscale brands, which is Sofitel, Pullman, and M Gallery, based in Singapore. Um, and that's really the first time in the ACO history that they have a global office uh, outside of France. And so within that team, and it's for me the first time to work in a marketing team, working with people with a left brain, um, <laughs> is to be, to be part of that um, you know, organization where we are working on marketing messages for the different brands, brand uh, delivery, brand content, and, but also the element of guest experience. Right. So everything around brand standards, uh, TripAdvisor, mystery guest visits. And then, and then I am the human resources development component. And I think I have the most unique title in the world, uh, having <laughs> service and attitude that's in my job title. <laughs> but that's really what it's all about. We, we, the, the whole thing that um, you know, Omar was also mentioning, it is all about the guest. You know, everything we do in our hotels has to have a guest-centric guest, uh, approach. And the, the modules and the programs that, that I work on with my team is, is really focusing on having the right attitude the, the service mindset, um, you know, is an excellent, um, you know, service from the heart to the guest. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, um, Paula, welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about Laurie, because we heard from, from Michael a little bit earlier. He gave us a little <coughs> insight into the sort of things that sure. Laurie did. But can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Laurie. I'm thinking about the story or the stats. I think I'll start with the stats and make sure the story is there, the narrative <laughs> is there. But I think what's interesting is Laureate actually began about 15 years ago. We had um, one school, less than 1,000 students, I don't know, $20 million in revenue. 15 years later, um, the organization, unique, no pathway to, to develop this. We had to make this up on our own. We are in 29 countries. We have 82 institutions, wonderful institutions. One of the very best, of course, is La Roche, because Sonia runs it, and so we're, we're in good, good shape there. <laughs> um, we um, employ um, full-time, probably um, over 40,000 uh, employees. So I, I sit here not just on the education side, but also as an employer of particular schools. And we're serving right now over 950,000 students worldwide. So this is a network that is, is really vibrant. 21, in 21 of those schools, we actually have medical licenses. So you can see a wide variety and the best practices that are shared, the international capabilities that, that, that go on. I think one of the things that's been interesting 
for me to listen to all of these wonderful entrepreneurs and employers um, through the morning is uh, the similarity between um, running uh, a hotel and being in charge of uh, institutions of higher education where our customers are student and having that same passion about the student and the personalization that has to go with that and making sure digital is involved. It's very interesting. We have very similar mm. challenges as we try to, to, to serve the student of today mm. uh, in our organization. One last comment, I'm just how does La Roche fit into all of, all of this? La Roche has a very uh, important role within Laureate. Laureate has selected its institutions. We don't have Laureate universities. There are no Laureate universities. We believe that each school should have its own, um, kind of like the blank slate, each school has its own mission, um, its own accreditation issues within its own countries, but its own vision, its own leadership, um, and uniqueness. So we acquired those institutions. We acquired most of our institutions. We didn't start from scratch with them where they had very specific, passionate missions, and um, mostly about serving a rising middle class that didn't have enough seats for, for mm. higher ed. And this passion that they bring to the organization, the uniqueness, is really important to us. So La Roche really plays a role um, within the organization of being a center of expertise. And all of the great work that they do in this one area that's so important gets shared worldwide. So it's a little bit about us. OK, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so we could, let's sort of dive into this discussion around employability specifically. Um, Michelle, how do, you, how do you further develop people? So as, as people come into your business, how, how do you develop this type? We did touch on it with some of the other speakers, but specifically, how do you do this? It was quite interesting, and I would like to, to mention to some, we speak a lot about passion, and thank you for saying twice that I was passionate, because I actually am. <laughs> but what is more importantly, you know, and I'm not only passionate, I'm something which is more important than that, I'm determined, trust me, you know, because it's going to happen. I mean, we're going to need to make some change, and we need to address this change. So, <clears throat> and then I'm coming now to the point about, you know, what do we do to further, to further educate? We invest a, a really a lot in training, first of all. And, you know, it's not just training program, and I think I'm also here, by the way, not just representing Kempinski, but speaking uh, on behalf of the industry, I think we need to reflect a lot more. We need to do a lot more studying within ourselves and saying, what do we do right, what do we do wrong? So to have a panel, by the way, like today, I think is, the, is one of the first starts, you know, we can actually do to make some change, because we need to change. So what, to quickly come back to Kempinski, one thing which we do next to obviously training and, 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 and looking at what the needs are, depending on the regions and the locations where we open properties, I think we have something I've been able to take advantage of, because trust me, my background is anything else than intellectual. So um, the fact really is I have had the chance to do with 47 years an MBA one of the best things which could ever have happened to me. And, you know, this is what Kempinski does. It's <coughs> okay to come, you know, they identified all of a sudden where there was certain areas within, within myself where I needed or I had opportunities to further grow, let's not put it like this, and it was invested in an MBA as an example. We do, so, you know, now I'm not just saying we do that uh, just with certain cases. We actually make sure that or we aim that every general manager has an MBA at one stage of his career with us. So that's, that's the step one. And then department heads naturally get the same. Now we have opened that up, this MBA, it's no, not anymore just GMs, it's now all of a sudden we are looking at specialists, because specialists is something we really, you know, when I speak about specialists, for me, uh, director of sales and marketing, as an example, is, is somebody we want to invest in as well. Because a success in this business is not just to become a general manager, by all means. So we, we have to change, and I think that's, mm. maybe before I get more carried away, that's what we do. No, yeah. that's, that's okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> what makes, no, you can get carried away, we're okay, mm. with, I'll watch the time, but, but <laughs> what makes somebody highly employable to Kempinski? But if you want to take it beyond, and you said you want to speak on behalf of the industry, you know, please do. Well, it, again, you know, it's, it's, we, we're just finding, I mean, why would a chef all of a sudden be able to identify talent? I think uh, the fact is that we need, to, we need to be careful of where we look for talent. Okay, here we talk about Le Roche, so therefore, you know, okay, I naturally have, assuming, great talent in front of me. So how do I know if somebody fits or doesn't, you know? And, and this is what some of the students, but it's not just the students, it's everybody forgets. And this is what I mean about being determined, because you really feel that. 
I know there's an intellectual approach with tests and everything else, and I'm not going to get into that, but there's the human side of it, you know, <clears throat> to feel, do you really want it? You know, for us being able to say, okay, this is what we are looking for, I mean, to start off with, and then to actually feel that there's a connection there. Mm. And I think that's really what we are looking for, and this is not something I believe you can just train. <laughs> You know, because you either have it or not. And, and like I said, I take even a step further. I really believe today that you cannot learn to love this industry, is it? I mean, either you love what you do and hospitality above anything else than that, you know, and, and if you don't, then you're certainly not going to be working. How are you going to transmit all of these guest touch points we were discussing about it if you don't have a certain passion, you know, and... Um, a pleasure in actually working in hospitality, mm -hmm. in the people's mm. business. Okay. So, so people might come to you, Dirk, and have, they might have the right training, they might have the, the real passion that we're talking about. Um, how, how appealing is the industry now, would you say to people? I mean, <clears throat> I, mean I, you know, I agree with Michel, you have to have a certain passion. Uh, and, and I think even more than that, you have to be a bit you know, cra cr crazy to work in the hospitality industry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do. I mean, uh, you know, work on Christmas, work on Chinese New Year, work on the Eid holidays, you know, work during Ramadan, you know, depending on where you are. It's, you know, you're there on the floor when the others are celebrating. Um, but I liked what Sonia also said yesterday, you know, it's, it's, you, you have to be also humble and hungry uh, to be in this industry and you have to love to serve guests. Um, I really miss actually working in hotels because mm. even when I was the training manager or human resources director of a hotel, I would be duty manager and my, my day would be fantastic if I would produce a smile on the, on the face of a guest helping him, helping him or her. Um, I think secondly, you know, there is no better place to work than in a hotel because every day is different, every day is fun, um, you know, we touch the lives of people mm. if they get if they have their birthday, their wedding, their 20s, 20s wedding anniversary. You know, it's, it's, mm. it always happens in hotels. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of emotions in a hotel. And if you can, you know, add to that. Um, I, I think, you know, working in a hotel uh, is, is very exciting. I mean, I know I choose to work in hotels because hotels are all over the world. And if you want to be geographically mobile, then, then that's your greatest platform. Right. That's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do, do you feel, based on what you just said, that it's, as Raphael was saying in the last discussion, it's <coughs> almost vocational. This. You have to really love the hospitality industry. You have to really want to do this. Would that be true? Yeah, I mean, Michel, uh, <laughs> sure. I can see the passion on your yeah. face. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, yeah, well, 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 I can say it again if you wish. I mean, <laughs> you know, look, I, I mean, I always go to schools and, and I, I'm amazed, you know, and I mean, I, you know, I don't have to be politically correct this afternoon because I want to be challenging too. And I said, you know, I'm sometimes embarrassed about how some of us go to these hotel schools and make presentations, you know, because we are very good at showing what we are and the beautiful hotels, you know. But I think it's also important that we, you know, that we talk. Have you ever realized how little excitement we have when we talk to somebody in the industry we represent. I mean, we had an ambassador this morning, and I mean, you know, I'm amongst many of you as well who are ambassadors, not just of, you know, of your brand, but certainly of your industry. And I think we need to just talk a little bit more also to the outside, again, how excited we actually are of being here today, you know? And, and you know, and, and I think this is where, where that whole talent cyclus will actually be, become a little bit better as well for us. I mean, we, we are training right now, training is the wrong word, excuse me, but I think we are almost educating our general managers and department heads today speak some individual uh, difficult uh, genders like, uh, you know, executive chefs as an example, who have attitude issues. And we're telling them again, you know, you have to actually a great opportunity to be a great ambassador. You know, you're very quick saying, I don't have the talent I need, but what have you done, you know, to attract it? You know, and I mean, we're not speaking about Generation Y here or whatever right now, but you know what I'm trying to say is here, and, and this is one of the brilliant opportunities uh, this afternoon again, is, you know, we are a great industry, but I don't think we speak enough about how great this industry really can be for certainly the one who aspire to enter this industry, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think uh, the hotel industry also needs to listen to, 
to the younger generation to, to see how if you really spot somebody with the right attitude and, uh, and where you can already see some entrepreneurial spirit mm. to you know, take them aside and mentor them and put them on that fast track you know, and don't wait 10, 15 years to make them a general manager. Make them a general manager when they're 30 right. years old. Right. You know? okay. and, and for example, in our core, we, we have that possibility also because they can switch between brands. Uh, you know, they can first do a Novotel for 200 rooms, which is less risky than, you know, running a Sofitel 400 okay. rooms in Shanghai, you know? So sure. I, th I think that's one element. I think the other element that, that I can see is, and that I can see that in, in Sebastian Bazin, but also like one of our uh, key leaders in Asia Pacific is, is you know, age, age is of no matter anymore. I mean, very soon we'll be managing three different generations in our hotel. You know, you, you will have grandfather, father and son. Most, you know, they could work in the same hotel. So how do you manage that? Mm -hmm. And they have different benefits. They have different expectations. But um, the CEO for Accor Asia Pacific, uh, he started something, I think, very unique, uh, very innovative. He's doing reverse mentoring. And he sits down oh, with uh, right. fresh graduates and, and one of my team members is a fresh graduate from um, the Singapore, uh, he has a bachelor's degree in human resources. The CEO is 61 years old, he's doing reverse mentoring and he wants the, the, the youngster to mentor him on you know, what's new, what's hot and what does LOL mean and <laughs> you know, <laughs> WTF and things like this, but... Um, <laughs> I will, you know, but <laughs> no, it's and and you know the fact the fact that he is doing this, the fact that he is doing this, it goes around Asia Pacific like, mm. you know, like faster than social media. Mm. It is like, it's like running water, I and I think that's fantastic. You know, we we now know what makes someone employable in Accor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, what, uh, what would you say is the role of of higher education in preparing our hospitality management students for employability? Well, let me first start by confessing something. Um, I am a hotelier wife. My husband <laughs> um, is, so, it's so okay. really, it's, it's yeah. Okay. No, so when I laughed when you said only crazy people go <laughs> into the industry, that's what okay. I was laughing about. Um, because, you know, I do, and I, I just was reminded about the fact that this is really, a, a really pa you know, it is a passion-driven business, and it seems very sexy. I have to tell you, to the outside world, right? And a lot of times our youngsters will get involved because they think this is a sexy thing to do. You're in gorgeous hotels, you're in great places around the world, you get to see leaders of government, you get to see all... But sometimes, you know, we have to be very careful if you want the right fit, that they have to understand the work that is involved. <clears throat> it's also very intense. It also requires 150% commitment. Mm. It requires wives that will become hat check girls because they can't see their husbands on the holidays, right? That's what I did. That's how I saw my husband when, I, when we were first <laughs> married, until I got too old to do that, um, as, as we saw it. So I think part of what education can, can do is that we need to be a translator about what the real expectations are going to be. Mm. And, and what do you mean translator? What I mean is we have to have a coupling with industry where we really know what the employers need from students on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of skills, in terms of behaviors, in terms of value structure, and we have to make sure that our curriculum is designed specifically for that. Right? We can't be um, theoretical. We have to be relevant. We actually have students who want us to be relevant, and if we're going to give you, provide to industry, what they need, we have to stop being in an ivory tower and we have to be really close with, with industry. Um, we need to understand um, not just the curriculum pieces, but how can we work together to do internships? I'll tell you, one of the things I'm most proud of about La Roche and, and some of our other hospitality schools is that internship is really intertwined. So students know what they're getting into. They get an opportunity to really work, to see what's happening. Um, and, and to not be, um, you know, and have a false sense of what it is, to, mm. to really get their passion ignited by watching real people in the workplace. I also think um, higher ed has a responsibility to have great career advising for students from day one. 
again, coupling it with, with that industry so that students are getting the best understanding about what the opportunities are. So I'm really excited about the SPA program that we're doing because it follows this, right? Working with industry, as well as helping us build a curriculum. We can have internships that are, are meaningful. We can um, really have the career development that's happening. I think it's not by accident that, <clears throat> I think, Sonia, what is it, about 89%, 86%, 89% of our, our students have a job by the time they graduate or have, mm. have one in the, in the pipeline. There, is an, there's, there are two other things, though, to this, and it's not just higher ed's responsibility, right? Industry has to come with us mm. um, and not just um, give lip service to it. You know, most of the people in this room are really very involved with it, but sometimes we get industry that says, we need this, well, gee, I wish we had known that in advance. Can we plan with you instead of being just uh, mm. reactive? I think we, should need, we need to be on the planning side uh, of what, what's happening. If we're going to have internships, will you mentor our students or will you just use them because it's really low-cost jobs? You know, you can get cheap mm. students with a lot of energy who want to prove themselves, and that's great employee. But are you going to mentor them so that they can really be? We need the right kind of environment for that internship. It's not just bringing somebody in for a first-time job. It's mentoring really strong potential um, at folks that are there. So I think those are the those are the things mm. that we need um, we need from industry. I think if we could start planning together better, we wouldn't hear so much. We don't have the right people for this particular field or opening or country if we could kind of have a closer relationship with it. And then I just, you know, have to say one last thing, and that is students have a responsibility. Students have a responsibility. I mean, everybody in this room who has had a good career, who's gotten you your good career? You've gotten you your good career. People have helped you along the way, but a school can only do so much, an industry can only do so much. People need to take charge of their career take advantage of all the opportunities that are there, and be sure that they're, you know, they're moving themselves forward. So that's kind of how I, I, I see the intersection happening and how we can help industry a little bit better. Okay, yeah. that's, I'm not, that's, in, that's not in every part of the world. I mean, I was talking to Sasha this morning, <clears throat> and I think by the time the students register at La Roche for the two-year education, I, I think they already have a job uh, before they even start, um, the, 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 but the, the next thing is that they have a job, and then the the competition down the road offers them a hundred dollars more, and and off they go. So you know, turnover in China, for example, is a huge challenge. Yeah. So what can you know? What can we train or counsel the students on to say? You know, can you please stay with one employer if you choose your employer? stay with them maybe for at least two years, you know, or three years after graduating. I mean, maybe I'm sounding ide idealistic, but... No, um, I don't, I, no as know? an employer, I want, when I invest in folks, I want them to stay along with me too, right? yeah. at least in order to get my return on investment, because <laughs> you know the first year you're still working with them and you're developing them. As, yeah. so I think, um, you know, I guess my feeling about that is that you're touching on something else. It's you're, you're, the schools have to do more. Um, and they have to do more on the lines <coughs> of behavior and values. We just can't assume that folks know how to behave in a, mm. in a business kind of situation. So I, I do think um, there's, some, there's some work that can be done about what is best for you in your career. It's not always just skipping. You know, I don't know if we give them enough career. It's sometimes it's staying within that organization, getting different opportunities, and then being able to move through. The jump for the $10 extra an hour or the event isn't really good for them. You can't blame them on certain jobs, but I think the employers then also have to say, let's invest um, with your ongoing, and if we do that, you know, you gotta stay with me a few years. But you see, for instance, what, what, what is quite interesting, what we realized at Kempinski as well, is uh, many gentlemen, I just felt that, uh, you know, talent, uh, such talent development, you know, is, is attraction, development, and retention. You know, that's basically the three elements I'm looking at. That this wasn't their responsibility. And I think that's where we need to change yeah. as well. I mean, you have people here today, general managers, who take the time, who come, and, 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 you know, I understand that the responsibilities they have are tremendous. So to allocate sufficient time to talent is, is crucial. But you know, you go to many hotel schools today, and I mean, you should know best, who do they send to? I mean, nothing against HR, but you see, who really should be there in order to understand these department heads, starting, starting with them, and then going to general managers. And I think that's when we're starting to bring a different dynamic into it. Mm -hmm. The ownership for us with talent is clearly with the general manager on top of it, you know? So, right. 
and then making sure that the department heads, which is the biggest struggle, understand, you know, I mean, many of them still today don't think that succession planning is part of their responsibility, yeah. it's just to you name another, another element. So here we have a lot of work to do as an industry as well, you know, in order to give you the feedback you right. want. Because here your feedback from an HR point of view may be a different one, with all due respect, than maybe what the general manager has or the department head. You know, so this is maybe why then yeah. panels in the future are going to be equipped quite differently. Well, I think that's you know. true. I do think that higher ed has, has gone first to the HR side of the house and not always gotten translated to what the operators are, are actually needing. I do want to say one thing, though. It's been my experience, forget, forget so much about hospitality, but employees, my experience with employees has been if they see their future with you, if you can help paint the picture for them of where they're going to be and how they're going to make a contribution and how they're going to be valued, you can overcome them the dollars yeah, if they true. feel like they have, they have the future with you. I, I think loyalty is built on understanding where that person wants to go and how you work with them to get them there. That, that's, that's really important to keep uh, you're right. can I, can I Can I just bring in Lee here for a second? Lee, could, I, could we just come to you for a moment? Because we're, we're talking about you know, longevity and how you create sustainable careers um, so that people don't go after two years and that you can create sort of loyalty. It, so the question is, you know, how, do, how do we inspire women, do you think, to create sustainable careers in this industry? So first of all, I'd just like to make a comment on the research that has been done about why people leave organisations. And mostly it's not because of the reward systems and things like that. It's because of the culture and the leadership in which they're operating. And that's the main reason why people leave organisations. Um, so, and I think that it then places some responsibility on us um, in terms of how we manage talent, how we create the right cultures, etc. That really um, makes people committed um, because they stay on a, based on an emotional level um, more than a transactional and financial level. I think there's always going to be that dynamic within that, and you've got to, got to accept some of those things. From a woman's perspective, I think from the research that I've been doing, if I look at it at an individual um, view, first of all, um, what I am hearing at, at a personal level is uh, the, the limitations that are put on oneself um, that actually stop career progression before they, they even need to kind of consider certain things. So I think um, actually being really clear about what you're passionate about, what you're focused on, um, and a lot of, a lot of the, ch the challenges that I think women face as they have families, etc. the most successful women in the research that I've, I've conducted, actually, it's not about not having it all. They do have it all, but they create boundaries around what's important and what they say no to. Um, so I think there's a lot to do around, you know, for me, attitude defines the altitude that you go. And if you're really passionate about something, if you really believe in something, you're working in the right environment, you're self-aware enough, so you develop yourself, you grow, you build that self-awareness, then, you know, um, you define your own altitude. Um, I, I do get a little bit frustrated at times, you know, because I think there's a lot of um, uh, emphasis on women leaning in and all the, all the language that you're using around this. Um, I think there's some really divisive, negative language about what women can and can't do. I think this has become a, a family issue, um, not a women's issue. And um, so a lot of these discussions are happening in, in the home environment. So my frustration is when we look around the world and we look at leadership positions, why do we not see more female leaders coming through? So when you talk about your talent pipelines and you talk about the culture and the environments that you create, how is it that you create programs for female leaders to come through, because we know actually it's healthy for organizations. It's not just about stats and quotas. It's, it's actually healthy for an organization to have diverse pool of talent that creates more creative thinking, et cetera, and, and solutions and, and better leadership. And yet I'm not seeing change happen, um, apart from a few tick box exercises and um, maybe um, some, some lip service that's paid to the agenda. So I throw it back out here and say, what is it you guys are doing um, in that space? Okay, that's an interesting point. Sure. I mean, Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, I, I think we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but Accor is definitely taking this whole diversity um, issue very seriously, not just about gender, 
also age is, is very important that any age group can <coughs> you know, work in a hotel. But if we talk about female leadership, uh, we started something two years ago called um, Women at Accor Generation. Um, and, and, and really the goal and the objective is to grow the number of female general managers from the current 27% to 35%. Um, and, and I think, you know, and we know, we know what you just said as well, is that if you have more female leaders in your organization, your business will be more uh, successful, for sure. <clears throat> and, and so that's not just lip service, um, especially like in Asia Pacific, we do a monthly, uh, we call it Empower Hour for, uh, um, for um, talking about the subject of developing female talent. We have guest speakers coming on webinars. Uh, so really creating that um, you know, awareness within the group and also slowly changing the mindset of, of people within the group. And, and secondly, you know, our senior leaders are now much more focused on, okay, if we have a vacancy for a general manager, I don't want to see only male candidates show me at least one female candidate uh, before making a decision on, okay, who are we going to put in that position? There are some cultural you know, issues still. For example, in China, it's pretty hard to have a female general manager, but we now have two, three out of the 180 hotels, so it's, it's starting to happen. But I, I think Accor is serious about it. Um, we just have still a long road to go, but yeah. M Michelle, why, why don't we have more women leaders? I mean, it, we can understand that maybe from a cultural point of view in Asia Pacific. I, in Europe, how, how big of an issue you know, is it for Kempinski, for example? Well, I mean, it's not even an issue for us. I mean, I'm not going to throw around stats here because I'm just going to tell you that we, we're doing it, you know? I mean, we, we just... I, I was saying before we, we do MBAs, you know, for the talent we really believe needs to be further pushed and, and where we see a future to become a number one. And again, not just a general manager, but a specialist as such. And 40%, okay, now I just said again is that, 40% huh? are women who just started now, I mean, just a week ago. So, I, I mean, you know, I see that going into the right direction. But I also tell you that this is not an agenda point for us because it should be a natural behavior. Because if I need to start making an issue out of it and saying, okay, what's the, what's the percentage of women have we got, you know, Yes, I agree with you, and I think we need to do that. It's, it's an interest we all need to have, you know? And, and I mean, I, I think it's almost a shame that we need to talk about it and reinforce and you need to express your frustration. No, um, you know, it's just, just a point, bring it across and say, why don't you do it? I think we get the message, but it should also, you know, it's not you and somebody who is gonna, who's gonna, gonna police you who is gonna change us. We, this has to be a natural behavior, and I think, you will see a change in that. You will see a change because I certainly have seen it when I come to Les Roches. A, how many women are already here, part of this training. And I think that is a very positive change on that. So that's what I believe. I can't change the past, but trust me, I will change the future. Um, I, I'm going to challenge back on that because actually I think, you know, um, boys clubs do exist. I think there's a lot of tribal behavior that continues to exist where you've got groupthink and you've got behaviors within organizations that make choices, even if it's unconscious bias, that still exists. And I don't think when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurialism and everything that we've mm. been describing today, I don't think we're being innovative enough in terms of the solutions that we create about, about women. And actually, if we're truly committed to making some change, and I'm not just talking about women, I'm talking about diversity and inclusion as a whole, because I think that's important. Mm. Um, but if we're truly committed to this, we are the leaders and the influences of these agendas, and yet we're not seeing the change in reality. So I just, I just want to push that back there, because I think actually it's, it's really great words, and in reality, we're still not seeing it. Can I just quickly say, so? okay, because this is part of my daily, daily job, you know, because one of the biggest things here is, and, and I'm just getting to it now, is, you know, because we have lateral entrance as an issue, as an example, okay? People who join later, want to join the industry as an example later. You know, what does it lead to at the end of the day? Somebody who is going to give you a chance, isn't it? You know, somebody, never mind if you're a woman or a man, is going to say, yes, I'm going to give you the chance. And you know, this is, if you ask me, what is your biggest challenge today is because as we're all discussing, recruitment is going to change, talent development is going to change, everything is constantly changing. But what it still needs at the end of the day, and we're still talking about people, is somebody sitting across a desk or whatever it is, 
and you desperate, you know, you want to get this chance that that person says yes, you know? And I always, my core message is always at any given time, you know, think back, you guys who have all this position, including myself, because there was somebody at one stage believed that he or she sees something in you and has given you the chance to basically get into this position. Mm -hmm. And you know, that will, that will be forever our biggest challenge, you know? We can, and there is no corporate policy which is gonna solve that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's not yeah. an answer to your question, but I'm just making a statement that this just, is, just, you know? Just um, to, to add the dialogue a little bit here. First of all, as a woman in business, I actually feel very uncomfortable talking about women's issues sometimes because I have a great diverse team. I have fabulous men working with and for me, and I have fabulous women working um, with and for me. And so there is some discomfort about that. I, I was sharing with some of the female colleagues here. You know, I even I hate bringing it up because, well, frankly, I don't want to act like the guys did and separate out the guys from the girls. I don't, I don't like that kind of scenario. But I do think the evidence does show that when you have a diverse staff of people, when you have diversity on your team, whatever that diversity is, age, gender, ethnicity, you get better advice. If you, the most important thing is to get A players. If you have A players, and those A players come from a diverse walk of life, when you as a CEO or a decision maker have to, have to make an important decision, you're then sure that you're getting really tremendous points of view, and then you make, you make that decision. So I think there is some progress there. I think that what higher ed is doing is bringing more women into the field. I think we have to encourage women from a higher ed standpoint to go into the right fields, because some women pick the service fields that are not going to get promoted to being general manager. They don't take the risk on being the, in the place where you're going to be held accountable. So when women say to me, well, Paula, how did you get that job? How did you get there? Well, because I got a small profit and loss area, P&L, and I produced day in and day out, and I hit my numbers. It didn't have to do with being a woman. It didn't have to do with being a man. It didn't have to do with being young. It was that I proved my worth every day. Take a risk. Be uncomfortable. Be a little scared. Get out of your comfort zone. But if you're not in a situation where you have to be on the line producing, either from a financial position or what I think is more important, sorry, an operating position um, where you actually bring the money into the company that the finance people count. That's just kind of my bias. Um, if you don't, get, if you don't <laughs> get in those roles, if you go into uh, areas where, where you're not seen as someone who can get into that general manager track, then you're not going to get there. So I think we need to encourage women to go in, into that. Just one last thing that I thought you said that was really wonderful, though. If your culture is far along that you already have 40% women, you guys are probably doing something great. But if your culture isn't, then you have to intentionally, my belief is you have to intentionally be sure that in your final candidates that you're reviewing for senior leadership that you, you insist that diversity is there. Mm. Not diversity that isn't equal, A player, diversity is there, because then you have that option. Because it's so easy to have in that final few, look, I, I fight this in my company too, you know, the final few, the final few candidates, we interviewed a wide swath of people, but the final few look just like the same people who are making the decisions all the time. So I think forcing yourself to do that helps to open up. I, I really encourage so that. I'd like to build on that. Ross, I know you're going to okay. kill me, but, you know, I'll just give you a little wink as well. <laughs> you're okay. Keep um, going. So <laughs> <laughs> um, but just in terms of I think there's something around actually culture, the feedback that I consistently hear for women is when they've got to make choice. And I'm, I'm in the same space around the women's agenda, and I also feel uncomfortable because, I, you know, lots of women I've spoken to have made successful careers and lives for themselves. Um, I do think there is something back to authenticity and people being genuine um, and, and able to authentically navigate their careers through organizations. And how do we capture that um, and enable it? Enable it. Um, just whilst I was coming back from a break there, and, and I completely agree with the feedback that I've had, is how many women find um, Sue an absolutely inspirational role model? And I think we need more inspiring female role models out there. And I know she's just dying to say something at this point, so I'm going to pass it over. OK, we'll have to be very brief, because we're actually out of time. So, but please I'll be do. very quick, and this is very controversial, and I'm really sorry if you upset a few people. I have 500 spas with 500 hotels under all brands, very much at the top end of the market. I have an 80% female workforce, and I still find senior management in hotels 
quite aggressive. So I think that if we want more female general managers, we have to get rid of that aggressive um, assert attack. It's aggressive as opposed to assertive. So we either have to teach the women to how to deal with that and how to deal with that aggression um, for them. I know you know you probably don't agree with me, but we see that globally. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, I fully agree. I mean, <clears throat> and that's what we're trying to educate our GMs as well is look the the old-fashioned autocratic style running a 400 room hotel that's passe you know you you really have to now manage your people differently I mean like you said I agree with you you know bad leadership if the leadership is bad of the hotel they will the employees will run away so mm. and I and I think we spoke about that at lunch as well if you look at the diversity of some of our GMs in our core um, you know, it's not just about male, female, it's also about um, sexual orientation, you know, and I think, you know, some of our, you know, male GMs who are gay, you know, if I can say that, um, they're absolutely fantastic and in, in, in di differently manage their, their hotel and their leadership style is also completely different, so... Service yeah. isn't about being macho. Service is about taking care of the people. So no, yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. That's that's bottom line. Right. Uh, <laughs> we, we are just we are just about out of out of time. Um, Paula, just as a end with, can I just ask you uh, just a quick question on? Sure. You know, we've spoken a lot about the range of skills today, yeah. and we've spoken a lot about service attitude around this table and in previous panels. Uh, but we're also touching on society as well. And so what, what, just finally, what, what's the role of sort of education in developing, you know, promoting society and a sense of community in what we do? Well, I, I think, you know, actually higher ed is absolutely uh, responsible for giving back to the community, right? And I think we give back to the community in a, a number of ways. It's, it's, by the way, fundamentally, we say that we do not have a successful year in our organization unless we've done a couple of things, right? Our students have done well. Our company has done well financially, so we can continue to go forward and protect the asset that we have, including jobs and so forth, and we've given back to our communities. Now, we happen to think that giving back to our communities, the most important thing we can do is to produce students who are job ready. And I don't mean just, we, we've talked about the skills. I want to make sure you understand behaviors are really important, right. too. Can they collaborate? Can they um, analyze? Um, can they be problem solvers? Can we keep that curiosity going? We're talking about a really a whole person, not just the skill set, a whole person going, going out there. So we think that fundamentally that's what we, we produce. On the other hand, we also want our, st our students to be students who feel an obligation. Uh, I know that's an old fashioned word, but I love that word, an obligation to give back. If you've been successful, if you've had these opportunities, if we're gonna make society better, all of our, our schools do special community outreaches because we want to build that muscle in our students. We want them to be leaders, not just in their professions, but leaders in their communities mm. and in their homes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very all good. right. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, once again, time has beaten us, but um, <laughs> it's a fascinating discussion and it's, it's interesting just listening to how it builds on those two <laughs> discussions that we had about innovation entrepreneurship before. Anyway, it had a lot of bite to it, that discussion. So, <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Can we just give a, a, a big thank you, please, to Michelle, to Dirk, and to Paula. <coughs> Lovely to meet you. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're entering sort of the final um, phase, if you like, of, of our day. So we're just going to have a very, very brief break. But please, I, I don't know. Is there any point in me saying that? I say that every time. It doesn't happen, does it? This really is a brief break. So this is like sort of two or three minutes. If you'd like to stand up and stretch your legs, anyone found leaving the room will be uh, dealt with. <laughs> um, so we'll begin in two or three minutes' time. Thank you very much. Thanks.